In today's video, we're going to learn about hash sets, a data structure that allows us to store values without duplicates. To use a hash set, we must first import it from the standard library. So up here, we're going to type in use standard library collections hash set. And just like with hash maps, we can use the new function to create a new empty hash set. So here we'll type in let mutable numbers of type hash set, which will contain an I32 equal a hash set new. Then we can insert elements into the hash set using the insert method. So let's type in numbers dot insert and pass in a value such as 10. And I will duplicate that twice, insert 20 and 10 again. Next, I will print this set so that you can see what it contains. So I'm going to type in numbers and run the program. And what we will end up with as an output is that the numbers contain the values of 10 and 20. So just like with any other language, sets cannot contain duplicates. Every value inside the set must be unique or will be unique because duplicates will be removed. We can also create a hash set with values using the following function because what we did here is quite silly, especially if you already know which values you want to insert into your set from the start. So we're going to remove all of that and type in let mutable numbers equal a hash set from 10, 20, and 10. And the only reason I'm inserting duplicates here is to show you that all duplicates will eventually be removed when we use the set. So now when we run this, we should end up with the exact same result. Although Rust is going to complain that we defined numbers to be mutable, even if we did not use that feature. Next, let's take a look at some of the common methods that we might want to use on our hash sets. So here I'm going to remove this print line, or actually we're going to leave it there because we're going to use it quite a lot. The only thing I'm going to change here really are the values that we have inside here. So I'm going to insert one, two, 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 three, and three. So once again, all the duplicates are going to be removed. And since we're not going to do anything to the numbers, we're going to remove the mutable keyword. So the first method that we're going to cover is the contains method. If at any point you want to check whether a value is present in a set, you can use the contains method. So here we're going to debug whether the numbers contains, and here we need to pass in a reference. So for example, we can pass in the reference of two. And when we run this, we're going to get true as an output because our set does contain the value of two. If we pass in four, this will return false because it does not contain that value. And the reason this requires a reference is to avoid unnecessary copying and to support flexible lookup via traits like borrow. But what do I mean by flexible lookup? Well, in the previous lesson about hash maps, you might recall me doing something a bit sneaky. And just to demonstrate what I mean, we're going to type in let mutable users of type hash set, which will be of type string, equal a new hash set. Then we can type in users.insert and pass in a string from Bob. And we're also going to pass in a string from James. Next, we're going to type in debug users contains and pass in Bob, a string slice. And this is going to work even if we defined our hash set to be of type string. So that's what I mean by it being flexible, because if we were to run this, you'll see that it will work perfectly fine. The users do in fact contain the string slice of Bob. And this absolutely beats having to pass in a reference to the string from Bob, which is a lot of typing and quite annoying. Anyway, let's continue with some of the common hash set methods. So let's create our mutable numbers once again, which will equal a hash set from, and this time we're going to pass in one, two, 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 three, three, four, and five. So we have a lot of numbers this time. And once again, we're going to pass in the numbers so we can see it each time we run the program. As you can see, the numbers contain these values. If at any point you want to remove an element from a hash set, you can use the remove method. So we'll type in numbers, remove, and we need to pass in a reference such as the reference of two. And this will remove two from the hash set. But of course, for us to see anything, we need to display it in the console. And now the second time we run it, we won't have two inside our set. And remove also returns a Boolean informing us whether the value we tried to remove was present or not. So here, what we're going to do to demonstrate that is create a variable called was present, and we're going to change two to something obvious such as 99. And by obvious, I mean something that obviously was not present. Then we're going to debug was present. 
And what we're going to get as an output is that was present is false. Now, if we were to pass in something such as one, which does exist, not only are we going to remove it, but we're also going to get a Boolean back that says that we did in fact remove it. If you want to get the length of the hash set, you can use the length method. Here we can debug, pass in the numbers dot length. And when we run this, what we should get as an output is that the length is five. This time length returns the length in terms of elements. And you can verify that by hovering over the length method in your code editor. The documentation will tell you that it returns the number of elements in the set. You can also check whether a hash set is empty using the isEmpty method. So here we can type in isEmpty and that's going to return to us a Boolean, which in this case is going to return false to us because it's filled with elements. Now, if you're tired of life and want to clear the hash set, you can use the clear method to remove all the elements from the hash set. So here we can type in numbers.clear and we're going to quickly debug it once again using my print line. And as an output, we're going to have an empty set. Another method that's very useful is the extend method, which allows us to repopulate our hash set using an iterable. For example, we can type in numbers dot extend, and this time we can pass in one, two, three, and four. And this is much more convenient than typing insert four times. And I'm just going to copy and paste this. And when we run it, we should notice that our set contains four elements now. And finally, now that we repopulated our hash set, let's try to drain it. And what drain does in Rust is clear the hash set and return all the elements. So to use it, we're going to type in let drained of type vector, which contains i32 equal numbers dot drain dot collect. So after we drain the elements, we want to put that into a vector so we can visualize that data much more easily. And with that, we can debug and pass in drained. And finally, I'm going to print what's remaining of our set. So now when we run this, we're going to get a syntax error in Python because I used the wrong shortcut. But if we run it in Rust, what we're going to end up with is that drained now contains these elements in the form of a vector. So we were able to collect those. And what's remaining of the set is nothing because we drained everything from it. So now it's empty once again. Moving on, let's look at how we can iterate over values using the regular for loop syntax. So here I'm going to create some users, which will equal a hash set from the following users, Bob, James, and Sandra. Anyway, now that we have our users, we can type in for user in users and we can print line, hello, placeholder, exclamation mark, and pass in the user. Or I don't know why I keep on doing that. I can just pass in the user directly. And when we run this, we're going to get hello, Sandra, hello, James, and hello, Bob. Although you should never rely on the order. Sets can't guarantee anything. When it comes to the order, elements are stored. Each run can yield different results in terms of order. So if we were to run this again, this time we have Bob that gets greeted first. So that's one thing you need to know. Sets cannot guarantee order. And finally, this wouldn't be a proper hash set video if we didn't cover the common set operations. So for this example, we're going to create HS1, which will equal a hash set from the following values. Fermo, that's interesting. What are you doing? What, what are you inferring? This is incredible. That is the longest type hint I've ever seen in my life. Anyway, we're going to insert one, two, and three. And this is the inlay type hint I was hoping for. Then we're going to duplicate this, type in HS2, and pass in two, three, and four. And the first operation we're going to look at is how we can combine sets using the union method. So let the result of type hash set that contains a reference to an i32 equal hs1.union and that takes other, which will be a reference to hs2.collect. Then we can debug and print the result. And when we run this, what we should get back is the union of these two sets. Next, let's look at how we can find what two sets have in common. And in programming, we call this the intersection, which also takes a reference to the second set, which will be hs2.collect. And now when we run this, we should notice that both sets contain three and two. That is the intersection of these two sets. 
Next, let's find the difference between these two sets. And we can get the difference of the two sets using the difference method. So here we'll type in difference, pass in a reference to HS2, and once again, call collect. And when we run this, what we should get as an output is one. And one thing important to remember when you're using the difference method is that order matters here. Because right now we subtracted HS2 from HS1. So these two elements were taken away from HS1, leaving us with the value of one. If we did it the other way around, we would end up with the value of four because these two were subtracted from this. So all we would have left is four. And finally, let's find out what the unique elements are in these two hash sets. And in programming, we call this the symmetric difference. So here we'll type in symmetric difference, pass in HS2, and then call collect. And when we run this, we're going to notice that the result is going to be nothing because I looked for the difference between HS2 and HS2, which is quite silly. So let's change that to HS1, rerun this, and what we're going to get as a result is one and four. These are the truly unique elements that we have in these two sets. And what I mean by unique is that both of these sets do not share these two values.